I'm going to turn it over to Cameron. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen and then uh, I just want to make sure you all can hear me. Mike, thumbs up if you can. Okay, great, great. Um, so I, uh, I want to start by telling you how sad I am that I'm not there with you in person. Um, I, uh, like many of well, like most of us, gathered with family over Thanksgiving, and we had a, a COVID or a member of the family test positive for COVID shortly thereafter. So um, such is the world in which we live. And so I uh, couldn't be here physically with you, but the magic of Zoom allows the work to continue and our connections to be made. Um, so I uh, want to, to present to you the findings of the initial uh, stage of our work, which was the survey that you all very graciously completed. I am wonderful about rabbit trails. So if at any point you'd like to uh, ask questions, we can, we can take those at the end, but you can also uh, feel free to interrupt and I'll try to engage as I can. Uh, uh, I um, am working off of multiple screens. So if you're watching me and I'm not staring directly at you and that's annoying, just forgive me that because my camera is in one place and then I'm looking at other things. So uh, that's just a, another condition of our tech environment in which we are um, existing these days. So I um, am, am excited to show you uh, some of the results. Uh, many of you know that we're living in interesting days in mainline congregational life, uh, particularly in the United States, though across the most Western countries, um, where we're seeing some trends, um, downward shifting trends in the ways that people engage institutional religion and congregational uh, settings. You all are typical in that way. And that's, I think, cause for celebration <laughs> because um, the results of the survey come back and say that you are actually a pretty uh, healthy, pretty standard, pretty normal mainline church in the United States right now. So and we'll talk about some of those dynamics. Um, that, that also is to say that you have enormous opportunities as many congregations do because our relationship with institutional religion, which we'll, we'll do some teaching about that uh, later, is changing um, in some pretty significant ways. And it's raising some questions about what does it mean to be church in 2022, 2025, 2030, uh, and beyond? And what are the decisions and investments that we wanna make today to ensure that, let's say 50 to 100 years from now, we have the kind of congregations that we want to see in existence for our children and grandchildren. So the, the bottom line to get to the punchline is that there's a great deal to be hopeful um, and encouraged about um, what we see with your congregation. And there is extraordinary opportunity, should you be courageous enough, brave enough, curious enough um, to really wanna lean in to this, um, this moment of interesting transition in congregational life that is happening across institutional religion. So without further ado, I'll jump in here. Here's my plan for our time. Um, and I just need to do a time check. Do you all think we have an hour? Because I think we have an hour. I mean, we could take like seven or eight because I have no life, but <clears throat> maybe you all do. Is this a yes? Yes, we have an hour. Okay, great. All right, so I, um, I wanna talk about the preliminary survey results. Uh, I wanna highlight some of the things that you actually said in your um, words back to us in these results. Um, time for questions, and then I've got some areas for consideration that I'd like to propose to you just to have in the back of your imagination as we're moving forward. This is a much longer process. Today is the first of many steps that we'll take together. Um, and so this is just setting sort of a baseline uh, for understanding where you are, and then we'll talk about what is to come. So um, in your survey results, 255 of you completed the assessment. Again, if you were among them, thank you for taking the time to do that. Um, many of you, most of you, have been a part of this congregation and have attended worship and or other events uh, longer than 10 years, which is, again, a pretty standard response. Um, so we're finding that the majority of people who are deeply invested in congregations have been so for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, um, many of whom actually have grown up 
uh, in these in these churches. Um, <clears throat> you also live um, in a fairly uh, geographically slightly compact uh, area. So interestingly, for a lot of UCC congregations in particular, we find that they're destination churches, which because of the UCC's kind of historic theology, um, when people are looking for a particular kind of church, they're willing to drive greater distances. You all actually are pretty embedded in a neighborhood environment. Um, so people living one to three, four to five, six to 10 miles away, you've got some really good um, solid anchors um, for those distances. Oftentimes when working with UCC congregations, um, we'll see that uh, the over 10 miles is a much bigger number than what you all are displaying there. So that's an opportunity for us. Um, we can, we need to dig into that. Um, I'm now going to skip to the end of the survey, if you remember you're taking it, and just go over some of the demographics of those of you who completed it. We have a really good range of ages who've completed the survey. So again, thank you all. Um, for, for making that happen. Um, you are a predominantly white congregation. Um, so I'm sure that's not a surprise to you. Um, you have, you're fairly well educated. You've got a nice range of from graduated college uh, to completed grad school. Again, a pretty normal uh, indicator of mainline uh, white Protestant mainline churches. Um, that's especially in the UCC, a typical demographic of who we tend to attract. This, this makes me enormously excited <clears throat> because here we've got um, a good diversity of both uh, uh, or of, of the whole age uh, range. And so uh, that is not something we typically see in UCC churches. So that to, is to be applauded and we want to celebrate and support that. So uh, and again, that was the number of people who completed the survey. Um, the vast majority of the congregation would label themselves as heterosexual. Um, uh, the vast majority of people who've completed the survey were female, uh, with about 30, 32% or so uh, male participation. Uh, and then your income is pretty diverse here as well. And so we'll, you can see, you know, just kind of how that lays out. Um, let me just pause. I, I don't know the size of the screen that you all are looking at, but can you see those numbers? Just so I have a frame of reference for how I speak to you going on these next slides. Has something happened? Lisa, can you all hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I just, I was hoping I could enlarge the screen here, but what we've got oh. is what we've got, I think. Okay. All right. Um, then I'll do, I'll verbally, I'll try to describe these as clearly as I can so that uh, even if you can't see, and uh, you can have a copy of this uh, afterwards. So if you need it printed, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, so getting into some of the nitty gritty of the details of your responses, most of you feel like your campus is uh, appropriately sized. You've got a good uh, parking access. It's easy to find. Um, uh, then when we get into questions like, are we a close-knit family, um, you moderate a little bit, so you get it 66.5% um, and then 17%, and you agree somewhat, somewhat disagree. Now, what we've seen as we've traveled through COVID is that that number is moderating for almost all congregations, and that's because we've been separated. <laughs> we've, we've had our relational engagement profoundly has uh, like unprecedentedly dis disrupted. And so our, our um, experience of connection to one another, connection to what the church is up to, connection about the where we're headed as a body across all congregations that we're studying right now with only one exception, and we're working with quite a few congregations, uh, those numbers are on the decline. So again, I would say you all are falling into the, the fairly normative patterns of what we're of what you should expect. Um, successfully engages uh, people of all ages, somewhat agree, is a solid uh, majority, is spiritually vital and alive. Again, someone or someone would agree is your strongest and then uh, 21 or almost 22% saying uh, strongly agree. And then has a clear vision uh, or clear mission and purpose. Uh, again, the vast majority of you, nearly 80% say, yes, we have a clear mission and purpose uh, for who we are 
as a congregation. Um, uh, again, a strong majority, strong, strongly agree or somewhat agree that you're working for social justice. Uh, you're very strongly committed to and believe that you hold strong beliefs and commitments or in values. Uh, again, nearly, uh, nearly 90% say the congregation supports vibrant ministries through the financial uh, and time investments of its members. Um, and again, another very strong statement of nearly 90% support members in developing spiritual practices such as prayer. So those are great statistics there. Um, uh, again, uh, uh, nearly 80%, almost 85% uh, uh, believe that the congregation is a source for learning for adults. Um, another strong percentage believe that the congregation is a source for learning for children. Um, again, another strong percentage, strong source for learning for youth and building relationships among members. Uh, there's a strong 60% say somewhat agree. And again, that's simple. We have to factor in the impact of COVID on that, but it's also an opportunity for um, potential focus for 2022. Uh, it, most of my um, uh, if I was to give advice to congregations right now, as we're regathering, um, I, my, my single focus, my single word of encouragement would be that because of the ways in which our relational fabric has been kind of uh, stressed, has, we've been pulled apart from one another, my advice would be that you all focus on rebuilding that relational fabric, to rebuild the friendships, rebuild the connections, just focus on being together, um, because that, uh, that really was under a lot of deep stress. It continues to be actually with the, these um, continued variants popping out for us. Um, uh, here we see, how do you, do you agree or disagree that the congregation engages all the senses in worship? Um, here we've got some variations, some, uh, the strongest group being somewhat agree, um, about 20% or 19% somewhat disagree with that. Uh, worship has, or has worship that makes me think, and nearly 80% of you said yes to that, 20% uh, said, you know, somewhat disagree with that, has worship that inspires all. Um, now that's again a difficult one to measure because we've gone, we've made a major shift from uh, being in person and having a certain rich, ritualized routine together to then needing to shift to an entirely different medium <laughs> uh, and doing this work if, uh, or this connecting work and this uh, engagement of worship and online has deep impacts on how we would report on that on our statistics. Um, and then has worship that calls me to action. Um, again, uh, a strong base and agree or strongly agree, but with about 25% saying disagree uh, on that. Um, so uh, here we get to, on the whole, uh, are you excited about the church, these kinds of statistics? And so I'll go through these as a table, since I know you all can't read the graphs. Um, this is where um, I want to just flag for us that, again, this is a pretty standard experience that we're seeing, but I, I want to recommend that we pay attention to this, that on the whole, I'm excited. Sorry, that is Harper my golden retriever who has decided to contribute her voice to our conversation this morning. So my apologies. Um, so on the whole, I'm excited about where the church is headed is 43% say yes. And then um, let's say 57% say no. Now there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, and again, the vast majority of congregations that we're working with right now would, would answer exactly that same way. Um, that's in part because some of you are just disgruntled that came across in the, um, the, the written survey results, but it's also in part a lot of you are disconnected. There's not a real clear sense uh, given where we've gone or what all we've gone through with COVID. Um, and so, you know, we're not really sure what to be excited about. Um, if I had uh, uh, answer true or false, if I had an idea for a way to minister to the world, our church helps me make that happen. Um, now, this is another place I want us to put a little or pay a little bit of attention to. So 55% um, said yes, they have, you absolutely believe that the church is a platform for your own expression of ministry. But 45% of you said no, that that's not your experience of church. Now, that may not be your expectation either. 
So that's a, a little bit of a complicated question there, but we want to make sure that um, we're that your connection to this congregation is one that enables you that, that builds on your agency as a person living out their faith. Um, you guys, I'm really sorry that she's losing her mind. Is it overly distracting? I can take a second and go deal with that. Yes. Okay. Can you give me one second? Let me just close this door. <clears throat> Okay, now, as we were. Um, so uh, a strong percentage of you, 52%, said that you think that the church is changing the community, which is good news. Uh, but then 47, or almost 48% uh, are not sure about that or think, no, that's just not, that's not what's happening at our congregation. So we'll be curious about that. Um, actually, other statistics show that you're you are donating or dedicating significant numbers of volunteer hours um, in, for community justice work and community transformation. So oftentimes when we see a, a spread like that, we might wonder, do you actually know what you're doing as a congregation? Is there an awareness of all the, the do-goodery <laughs> that, um, that the congregation is up to? Uh, and so we may just need to do a better job of communicating that and a better job of storytelling. So we'll see. Um, the church works with other congregations and businesses and nonprofits to achieve common goals. That was pretty uniformly affirmed that at 80 percent. Um, and then my religious life is very significant to me, not surprisingly, but definitely reassuring uh, that 90 percent of you um, said that, yes, that is true for you. Um, now, how would this have changed if we'd asked you this in 2019? I want to just stress that actually there wasn't a whoops, significant change. So here's the question. Let's just look at the first. On the whole, I'm excited about where the church is heading. So uh, in today, 43% of you said that that was true. Um, in 2019, 47, 48% of you would have said that. So now we're looking back and we're saying, well, in 2019, I might have been more excited about where the church was headed. Um, that is really just an indicator of all that we've gone through <laughs> as a community. So we're seeing a flagging in our investment in and our excitement about what we're up to that we want to attend to. But this is not, not in my, for my mind, um, reason for concern, just reason for attention. And again, I want to stress entirely normative um, for what you guys have or what we've all been living through in this. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because there wasn't a whole lot of variation. So I'd like to just keep moving if that's okay. We can come back to it if you've got questions. Um, now we're going to shift to um, questions about um, the intent, the, the hope that is in the congregation for living out its values and mission. So do you agree or disagree that the congregation wants to be racially and culturally diverse? Um, uh, nearly 70% um, said that you strongly or somewhat agree that that is a desire of the congregation, but 15% or 20%, I guess I should say, strongly disagree that that's a desire of the congregation. Um, you want more members, again, not surprisingly, particularly for um, primarily white Protestant churches. Uh, we want more active participants is off the scale. It's, um, you know, almost the entirety of your percentages there. Um, and that is uh, because you all are experiencing um, or you have the perception of experiencing some decline. Uh, and so that's that's our fix for that in, in our imaginations. Um, our welcoming of people of all races, uh, the vast majority of belie believe that that is so, um, is welcoming of people of all sexualities and genders. Um, fewer of you believe that that is so, but still the vast majority believe that that is so. You've got a, a, a jump there of uh, set to up to 17% uh, who disagree with that. Um, deals with disagreements and conflicts openly uh, rather than in hushed, uh, hushed and hidden behind doors. Um, and here's where we get some interesting information that we're going to, to see more of in just a few minutes. So here you're now signaling to us that you all have been through some conflict and that, that the way that that conflict was dealt with was not out, uh, was not uh, in a way that, um, uh, 
followed any, uh, that consistently uh, followed institutional norms uh, in the sense of it, that it was handled appropriately. So that there was uh, hushed conversations, there were clicks, there was rumor mills, those kinds of things that uh, did in fact happen when you indicated that you went through uh, some of these, some conflict uh, that's been in your recent history. So there's, what this actually signals is that there's awareness of conflict and that the way that that conflict was dealt with, um, you all feel you could maybe do better. Um, I, I honor that in you. Now, here's where, uh, here's where I got nervous. <laughs> um, and so we'll just, we'll just sit with this. Does our church embrace change? <clears throat> oh, you guys. Um, so we have 38% uh, say yes, but 62% say no. Um, uh, that's a, that's going to be a challenge. Now, again, the older a human system becomes, any kind of institution, whether it's a congregation or a business or a government entity, the older it becomes, the least resilient and open it becomes to change. So this again is a statistic we'll see grow as, it, as any system gets older. However, <clears throat> this could be a challenge. So we're going to need to play with this, uh, this dynamic. Our church regularly does new things in worship. You actually are fairly evenly uh, split on your perception of that. Um, our mem members of our church are willing to change in order to achieve our shared goals. Again, we're seeing statistics going in directions that are a little bit cause for concern. So 63% said no, our, our members uh, are not willing to change in order to achieve shared goals. Uh, and then 37% said yes. Um, it's easy for new people to join existing church groups at our church, 60% about uh, said yes, 40%, um, 41% about said no. Um, so that we need to break down based on age and based on tenure to see where's the friction, where's the sticking point for people feeling a sense of belonging. And then our church is more comfortable with things remain the same off the chart. Um, yes. So 86% of you said yes, our church is far more comfortable when things remain the same. So on the scale of change that we're seeing in church or change dynamics, you all are very high in your <laughs> resistance to change, which means um, if you want to do anything different, <clears throat> bold, interesting, um, we'll need to work on that anxiety that exists in the system and the kind of pushback that you all would, would need to normalize and expect might come your way. Um, again, new ideas are always welcome at our church. Uh, about 55% of you said, no, that's not true. And 45% of you said, yes, new ideas are welcome. Uh, our members are always willing to try something new. Again, we start to see the perception here and probably the experience of some of you that 70% said, no, um, uh, our members are not always willing to try something new. 30% said, yes. Putting a new idea into action, our church takes a long time. Here again is another indicator. 88% said yes. It takes a very long time for new ideas to get activated in the church. 12% saying no. Um, here you're split fairly evenly. Our church loves the enthusiasm of people with new ideas. Um, that's encouraging that 52% said yes. Uh, in our church, we pride ourselves on embrace of and success of constantly changing to improve and adapt. Again, you start to sway heavily towards, no, that's not true about us at 65%. And we frequently talk about change during worship and other activities of our church. And that is, yes, at 77% say that is true. We talk about it, <clears throat> but your other indicators might say that you don't actually actualize it. Um, so 42%, 43, close to 43 would say no to that. Um, we're almost through to this. I know your, your eyes have to be bleeding by this point. You're perhaps bored to tears, but it's important that we know these, um, these statistics about the congregation. Um, uh, the vast majority of you practice individual prayer, meditation, or devotions uh, on your own, uh, sometime, or daily or several times during the week. Um, uh, your group practices, group prayer practice is uh, swings the other direction. So you never or, or just occasionally practice, have group prayer practices. Individual Bible study, um, you almost never or 
very, very occasionally uh, practice that, uh, though 21 uh, plus 18 of you <laughs> do. Uh, uh, fasting, not a big thing uh, for you all. Again, that's pretty normative in uh, Protestant mainline congregations. Um, family devotions, we actually did see an increase in this. Of course, because of COVID, we were all locked in our uh, little family units, uh, our little monastic enclaves. And so the personal, personal devotion and family devotional practices, we see a, a, an increase in those, um, but that's to be expected. Again, group Bible study, almost never uh, or occasionally, and then exploring timely topics. Um, you do that occasionally uh, or sometimes weekly or almost weekly is, your, is a, a good chunk in that space. Um, back in 2019, again, I'm not going to focus on this because you didn't have wild variations, but again, we see an increase in some of those personal practices because we do them collectively. Um, shifting gears entirely <clears throat> to your facilities, <laughs> most of you believe that your facilities are appropriately sized for the congregation. Um, and those of you who receive news about the church receive it primarily through email. <clears throat> But then right behind that is word of mouth and or social media. So we know that those three um, uh, uh, communication channels are important for helping you all stay connected and knowing what's going on there. Um, the vast majority of you and overwhelming be believe have the perception of uh, that the congregation is shrinking. Your statistics would prove that out. And again, that's really for mainline congregational life in the United States. Um, you believe your facilities are in adequate and, and or good condition, so there's not a lot of work that needs to be done on the buildings, which is wonderful. Uh, that's a tremendous asset for you. And overall, um, there is, uh, a, compared to five years ago versus today, there is greater uh, awareness of financial strain and or anxiety about fi the financial future of the church, where you can see here today, um, uh, would you describe your how would you describe your congregational financial health? Today, there are more of you that would say it's, it's some difficulty or you're tight, but you manage um, with a solid percentage saying your finances are good. Uh, five years ago, um, you all would might have reported more strongly that you felt your finances were good to excellent. Um, <clears throat> that has that factually may or may not be true. Again, this is a survey based on perception. Um, in, the, in the recent two years, has your congregation experienced any disagreements and or conflicts? And the again, the overwhelming majority of you are aware that the congregation has indeed experienced significant conflict. Um, you would rank that conflict as major conflict. <clears throat> um, so it wasn't just minor relational things, but it was some major disruptive uh, disagreements where members, some members of the church uh, decided to step away. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, let's see, so this is some members of the congregation left. You can see they're at 88.5 or so 89%. Um, and then here's how you all said you like to deal with conflict. So um, usually on these, the highest percentage is would defer to the head pastor and leadership of the congregation to manage through those. Um, you all are uniquely high on we avoid the issue. <laughs> so we will want to, again, attend to interesting that we're resistant to change and that when it comes to conflict, you're reporting that you'd rather avoid the issue. So as a system, we might wonder about, are there tools that we could put in place that make difficult conversations just a little bit easier um, and more normative behaviors and practices on how we can talk through the things that really matter most to us without um, breaching or um, destroying our connection to one another. So <clears throat> on this one, uh, uh, what's also interesting is that you all reported that you've had almost zero training uh, with healthy engagement uh, with differences of conflict uh, in the past five years. So a, a, a no-brainer recommendation to you, and again, I want to stress to, a, to a many, many, many congregations who are going through the, these stressful days, um, the, our political climate plus the, the stress of a pandemic and the economic impact of that has amplified uh, all of our 
uh, stress stressors in our own lives. And the way we see that manifest is that uh, we're seeing increased levels of conflicts across congregations. Um, so the better equipped you are to deal with those, to, to face into those creatively, uh, and the more tools you've got to do so, it means that you can use those moments for um, creative relationship building and deepening of your connection to one another instead of uh, creating deep harm, um, which is what we'd want to avoid. Um, so uh, actually, I'm going to pause and just ask what questions about any of this. I mean, I went through it so fast. I can't even imagine that you uh, have questions. It must have all been clear as mud. For some of the questions that were asked, particularly in my situation, I didn't answer how I felt, but how I perceived the congregation as feeling. So that might be, might skew the results a little bit if other people might have interpreted the questions the same way. It could be, but with a response pool of 255, or two, I'm sorry, 225, um, <clears throat> that, that's probably a negligent or negligible swaying, but it could very well be too. Thank you. Anything else? Can I keep going? Yes. 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 All right. So, um, so I, again, I want to stress. So, uh, the fantastic news about you all as a congregation is that there is nothing deeply broken. <laughs> there's, in fact, there's a whole lot that's working right now. There are some among you who are pissed. <clears throat> you're pissed at life. You're pissed at human. You're pissed at the situation we're in. Um, and those. Uh, feelings came through on the, um, the responses and then um, and those were outliers so we could very clearly see that some people who completed the assessment had agendas that they wanted to make sure got across but there were only a small handful of those so out of 225 on the whole what we can say uh, is while you all may experience some fracturing and some um, uh, irritated people on the whole you actually are a congregation who is um, committed to what you're up to, um, who is uh, wondering about where you're going as a congregation, as are every, as is every congregation right now. Um, and um, you remain uh, committed to each other. There are friendships that you all have built through years that are holding you together um, and that mean a great deal to you all. So there's a wondering now, what is the pathway uh, that in my job, my, my role, we, I work with congregations across 11 different denominations and, and study this work at, uh, at, at the large system scale. My wondering is what is the path of the, the mainline congregational church in the United States? And I ask that on your behalf because you all are classic case study of that all of the indicators and trends that we're seeing across the nation, you all are embodying in all of these statistics. So what is it that we want or could expect perhaps for our future? Um, some of you may know the, the, it's a psychological model, it's an archetypal model called the hero's journey. Is this ringing any bells for anyone? So West, Western imagination was highly, uh, influenced by uh, this, this model called the hero's journey, which was um, made accessible to many of us through the work of Joseph Campbell, uh, who you might, some of you might remember, Bill Moyers did a wonderful series with Joseph Campbell on the hero's journey. Um, the idea is that all of us as human beings, both as individuals and as, as congregations, as systems, uh, even as companies and corporations um, are actually on, um, on a trajectory, on a journey that involves certain calls to adventure and involves certain points of decision that change the, the, the path that we, one might take. And so I started playing with this. Now I want to make, I want to tell you, I've made this entirely up. <clears throat> so, you know, I could be like completely off, but let's play with it as a possibility. 
Um, I would say that your congregation, as I'm learning about it, is, has actually gone on an adventure where you have you have now separated yourself because the vast majority of you believe you're on decline. You, you see some of the issues that are cropping up. So you, you don't have the illusion of being uh, living in the good old days of church, right? So you separated yourself from the illusion of being a healthy church as that was defined in the 1950s and 60s, to which I would say hallelujah, because that church is never coming back. Um, that was an unsustainable model and the world in which we live which we'll talk about. Um, and then we went through as congregations, this imitation, this copycat imitation movement. So we would look at the big evangelical churches primarily, and we would say, well, they've got the sexy uh, children's program, or they've got the amazing band and all the great music, or they've got, you know, and so we would go try to copy what we thought was working in other places, or the denomination might come out with the latest VBS program, and we would think, well, that will get families with young kids just flooding in our doors. Um, and so we were always looking for kind of the quick fix, um, and we've gone through that cycle enough now that I think there's not such a naivete, though the impulse remains, which we'll have to resist. And then we started saying, well, it's the pastor's fault that the church is declining. And so we just need to get new pastors. We would really like white men with young children. And so we'll go back to that model because that worked really well. And so we set up the savior complex. Well, if we could just get the right pastor, then this would solve the issues that we're experiencing, where we're seeing decline, we're seeing increase in disagreement, we're seeing um, breakdowns of the ways that programs used to work. And so we identify people and or uh, processes that we want to target to say, well, that is the source of our discontent. Um, and you go through enough pastors, and then you realize that that actually wasn't the issue, um, that there's some other dynamics going on there. Uh, and in some cases it is, but rarely actually is it the true issue. And so we get, uh, we get down to this place of critical decision points. And so we've, we've finally become curious about, all right, uh, the way we're working isn't working. And could it very well be that the spirit is calling us into connecting and organizing with one another in, in a different kind mm -hmm. of model that is a little more honest, <clears throat> that's a little more agile, that's a little more um, uh, uh, current with the, with the times and with the needs of our community? And it's a little closer to the ground, frankly. Um, and so we reach this critical decision point where we have to decide um, are we going to be curious about what other ways we could be church together that might give up some of the institutional trappings that we've been holding on to for so long, um, but that are have gotten us this far, and we thank them for that, but are not sufficient for taking us further. That is the critical decision point facing mainline institutional religion in the United States right now. You all are at that point. <laughs> um, now, our wondering is, uh, do we want to change uh, in order to be curious enough to think, hmm, well, what now shall we do? So the, the, um, the bad news, if I could say that, is <clears throat> so once we say, okay, like, let's be curious, let's go, let's go look and see and sense and try to discern what, what God is asking us to, to um, think about here, um, we immediately fall into uh, this a series of temptations, um, hopefully just one, but maybe a bunch of these. And these are the standard ones that we see in church. And this is often where people like me come in and work with congregations. And my experience on my end is that the congregation wants to find the most creative ways they can possibly find to absolutely change nothing. <laughs> So they would like for me to help, you know, uh, create some story around, but let's not actually change anything. And so that's that top line. This resistance to change is real. And the, um, the firewall in it is that there's a deep nostalgia in all of us uh, of what has been. Uh, and that nostalgia pulls as a resistance force uh, to our uh, openness to change. Um, religious extremism is another uh, 
uh, example that we're, we're, we've seen now for nearly 20 years. Um, I, I don't need to go into that with you because that's not something active with you. Spiritual aridity is when the church becomes the country club. And it's a wonderful group of friends, but it doesn't nurture and deepen your spiritual life. Um, and so, uh, again, I, I don't know, I, I think that that's some, that's true for some of your people, but that's, that's not an, an overly active uh, dynamic there. Um, analysis paralysis could very well be a part of the uh, challenge that you all might face. So what we want to uh, put in place is just an awareness that we can't talk an issue to death uh, in, as a way of escaping actually needing to do something about it. And then the final one is that you, congregations can decide they just don't want to change anything. And that's fine. It just means that you'll be increasingly culturally irrelevant. And so that's okay too. That's a, that's a choice that a lot of congregations make. Um, and that's just human, human systems, human nature. So as we get through that, um, we end up having to remake not so much the outside of church, which is interesting, but it's remaking our mindsets of what we're up to. It's a significant mental shift that uh, congregation leaders are, are going through right now and understanding what does it mean to be the body of Christ in the world. And as we go through that shift, which comes over time, this is not a quick fix, um, then we end up uh, le becoming uh, congregations that have greater intentionality and greater a greater sense of authenticity uh, as people encounter us. So this is kind of the journey, uh, a model of a journey, insofar as it's helpful for understanding uh, what we're up to together. So I wanted to just put that in our imaginations, not as something that says, you know, like, this is proscriptive, but maybe it's something descriptive of the days in which we're living. Any questions or reactions, responses to this? You remember, I made it all up. Okay, then I shall continue to go. So in your own words, here are the things that you said. So what keeps you involved in the church? Not surprisingly, it's members, family, um, uh, you've, a lot of you have been involved in the congregation for a long time. You have friendships that, that hold you here. Uh, that's all very wonderful and very normative. Um, what do you want to be able to say about the church in two years that you couldn't say today? And that is that you'd like the congregation to continue to be vital and robust. Um, you'd like to stay your current size. Um, so you'd like to kind of just freeze in place, if not freeze freeze from um, the image that, that you all have collectively of um, days in which the church was um, supporting young families, was growing, um, was uh, uh, a place where you felt deep connection and your spiritual life was fed. So all of that, again, uh, is you like who you are and what you're up to. You just are worried about the threats that you're seeing on the horizon um, and or in your face. What could hold you back? Um, these are direct quotes from some of you from the uh, surveys, and they're included here because they were mentioned um, many times. So these are representative of themes that we heard in your responses. So many of you, a significant number of you said an unwillingness to change or adapt to new things. Um, a number of you said we're all getting older. We need young people to come to the church and stay in the church. <laughs> um, so there's a desire among of you to want to, to pass the baton, if you will, or at least know that the baton can be passed, that uh, some of you may not want to quite give up influence yet, but you're wanting to know that that um, feeder system is in place. Um, and then a significant percentage of you said we have some hurt people in our congregation. We also have some people who need to let go of their agendas, and we need help with healing. So a lot of you see uh, that, that this is a, a block to your ability to move forward. Um, and that if we don't address that, and my advice would be if we don't address that early on, um, <clears throat> that that could actually impede uh, what you all are capable of as a congregation. So um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put one more image in your mind. I'm gonna pop this up on the screen really quickly. Uh, uh, and again, these are things we'll revisit. So I, I'm, I'm I'm operating here between facts delivering and then teaching, if you'll grant me that um, rhythm. So this is a standard bell curve. Uh, and this is the, the cleanest and most um, uh, uh, 
lacking in reality model of church life <laughs> that I could imagine. So actually think of it more like the Dow Jones or the stock exchange oh, you know, ups and downs, but here's a clean and simple model for us to study initially. There are four indicators in any congregation that are operating at any time. And so I've written those as energy, inclusion, program, and administration. Um, by inclusion, what I mean is that um, we're willing to extend our personal reputation on behalf of the church to invite other people in. So we're proud of our church. We um, don't mind, like we're not worried we're going to be embarrassed by inviting people to come. Um, and so we're willing to extend our personal uh, credibility on that behalf. And then programs and administration, I hope, are, are clear. Um, so when we're at a new church, let's start down on the bottom left quadrant there. We call that quad one. Um, when you're a new church, you're just an idea, really. So it's a it's an idea that has enormous energy, attractional energy. And so hopefully, if you communicate that well, um, you are able to rally a lot of people. And you can see that the indicator of E is capitalized and all others are lowercase to indicate its uh, impact in the system at that moment. So as the idea catches on, inclusion increases because more and more people are willing to say, yes, I want in on this thing. I'm willing to give life energy to it. And then we get up above the line of financial sustainability, which is to say financial sustainability. That is, we have enough people in the system to financially afford whatever model of church we're trying to achieve or whatever model of community. That's a different number for every, every system. But once we're above that, that means we don't have grants or denominations supporting us. And therefore, there's nothing really that can take us out of existence quite suddenly. Um, and so that's the, the goal for these systems. And then we get up to the very top of this where we have um, high energy, high inclusion. People are excited about what's going on. We have programs that are in alignment with the mission vision and values of the congregation and that are scaled appropriately for the number of people in there. And then administration is in service to, to ministry. So management serves ministry, not the other way around. And that's usually when I ask people, what, what, tell me about the, your best stories of the church, your best days. I'll get stories of that moment for them that may be different points on the timeline. But that's the story they're telling of where energy inclusion programs and administration were all working in a way that felt life-giving and vital and exciting. But inevitably, <clears throat> without fail, and again, in all human systems, um, as we age in these systems, life changes, dynamics change, culture changes, people change. And we'll see the first indicators of shifts in the system by a drop in energy. And if we're on top of it, which you all are, um, then you begin to put in place ways in which people can reconnect with the vision and mission of the church. This is in part why Habitat for Humanity became such an extraordinary success, because churches who were in the 80s in particular, 90s, um, hitting an energy drop systemically across denominations, they got people busy building houses. <laughs> and that building of homes together rewove the relational fabric and reminded people of why being church together made a difference, a real difference in people's lives. And so that was enough for a lot of congregations for a moment to keep that energy up. But if you don't catch that, if you don't do something to interrupt it, then you'll see as you go down this line, a drop in inclusion. And that's when we have a sense that there's something not quite right, but we don't know exactly what it is, but we don't really want to invite people in because we're not willing anymore to extend our credibility uh, on behalf of the church. And that's usually when we start to see financial issues, people um, increase of conflict, people withholding their giving. Um, and so we get right to that, that line there. And then as we drop below that line, you'll see an increase in inclusion. And that's always the mantra. We just want families with young kids. Um, and that's, of course, because uh, all the systems are falling apart. And we want we need people to take over both the ministries and the, the money. <laughs> and then finally, you get down to the end where you just have, um, as the congregation that I was the pastor of in this last iteration, I walked in and we had 23 members and 26 pages of bylaws. It was amazing. 
Um, <clears throat> I'm glad to say they're doing much better today, but uh, that's where we end up. So my wondering is where would you all diagnose yourselves on this? But not all at once. It's hard when you talk about <laughs> it. Hi, Cameron. I think I think we all perceive ourselves on the downside of the slope. So yeah, but where would you I don't think I put us in that lowest quadrant, but somewhere up above maybe where your point is in. I... Okay. So somewhere in here. Yeah. Okay. Anybody anybody have another perspective? Are we in universal agreement? You'd say we're closer to the bottom? I think we went up from the bottom on the right hand side. I kind of see us there now. Okay, so below the below the line of sustainability? Below the line. All right. So so we're past the, you know, we've we're past the we're seeing decline in programs. Um, we're wanting the families with young kids. Um, we're, yeah. Okay. Any other perspectives? I think we're a little higher than that. In, in church this morning, for example, I, I don't need to come to nine o'clock. I was amazed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, this is Carla Drysdale. Um, yeah. I think we're a, a little bit higher than, than that, only because I see hope in that yeah. um, we had many families in church this morning. I'm not usually a nine o'clocker, but today I was, and it just, it warmed me to see so many families, and I didn't know these families, so they're coming, they're, they're new, new attendees which I find very encouraging. Yes. Okay. Any other perspectives? Uh, this is Mark Jakey. Uh, I, I wonder about our inclusions at some times. Maybe that's tied to the fact that I, I personally do see it and then willingness to change. Maybe I embody that as much as anybody. Um, so I guess I wonder on what side of the line of sustainability we are. And I, I think just by the sheer fact that I think we're in really good financial shape, I'd put us in the upper third quadrant. Okay. So you'd put us up a little higher. Um, yeah. I, I think we got some room to move, but uh, we, if we want more, I think we have to ask those critical questions. What do we have to change to be attractive? Yes. Okay. Any other perspectives? Well, I'm going to take a, um, a typical po politician's route and to say you're all correct. <laughs> so, statistically speaking, you all are a higher quad three church. So, just if I didn't, if I didn't. Um, know anything about you all if I was just looking at your demographics and then the results from the survey you all would be high quad three but your perception of yourselves among some of you of course not all of you is a little bit lower so so perception wise somewhere in the system there's actually a story that says we're not like we're actually lower we're actually in bigger <laughs> Uh, experiencing bigger systemic um, stress than what the statistics indicate. So that's interesting, isn't it? That that um, when we look at the giving numbers, the attendance numbers, the the statistics, insofar as they're accurate, um, which is always a question mark with congregations. Period. Not not that's not a personal job, but yours. Um, so far as in they're accurate, you all are above the line of financial sustainability. Um, you're, you're experiencing all the classic case study quad three dynamics. Um, but for those of you who have been on this journey long enough, you're aware of the changes 
and the your anxiety may be uh, surfacing a different story of falling below that line of sustainability. So there's some perception difference there that's not uncommon, but is interesting that we'll pay attention to. Um, we'll ignore that. So here are very quickly, because I know we need to get out of here, areas for consideration. So as I said before, um, I would really advise that you all spend 2022 laser focused on reweaving the relational fabric um, of the congregation, of reconnecting to one another um, and, and loving on one another um, in all the uh, entirely appropriate ways, please, people. Um, but uh, Margaret Wheatley, so she was a sociologist and philosopher, uh, she said uh, a few years ago in a lecture that I was listening to, she said, you know, it's it's like our our um, our culture is functioning like a centrifuge, and a centrifuge is designed to separate particles intended to be together, but separates them by the force of speed. And she said, "What's separating in our culture right now is our connection to one another. Is the relational fabric that makes up our families, our our neighborhoods, our our wider communities, our cities, our towns, and in we could certainly argue our nation at this point. And so." If, if your congregation did nothing else except attend to, to take responsibility for the reweaving of that connection, that relational fabric, I don't know of any better expression of being the body of Christ right now in the world and what is needed more than that work. So if, if you all could spend as much creative energy pondering how do we just love on each other um, and reconnect with each other, I... I truly believe you'll see payouts on that. Um, vision, our mission and identity, there's ambiguity there. And I don't think it's that actually because you're not clear what a congregation's designed to do. It's that we've been so separated and so disrupted that we may need to remind our bodies. Um, so much like the Habitat for Humanity story, you get together and build homes together or go on mission trips together, or you have some sort of experience, an embodied experience that that helps your, you at the cellular level remember the mission and identity of why we hold this faith, why we gather as we do in these congregations, um, and ultimately thinking of a congregation as a school of love. Um, how can we become more loving people, and then how do we live that out as our mission and our identity? Um, so we'll dig into that. And then the third one, culture of trust and communication. There's a fracturing of trust that has happened uh, in the congregation that we just need to rebuild um, to ensure there's sufficient trust, sufficient enough that you all are willing to do that work of mission uh, mission and vision and, and expressing that in the world together. Um, your, your trust levels are not uh, off the chart low, so I'm not overly concerned, but I'd like, I'd like to encourage you all to pay attention to the ways in which you say yes to each other. Um, and then the ways in which suspicious uh, narratives get anchored and fed in the system. So I've told you way more than I know. I'm right at the hour. Um, I have like, you know, 15 more slides, but you'll just have to have bated breath to receive them through email. Um, so any final thoughts or questions? Hey, I just... We've been encouraged to urge to complete the surveys as honestly and as freely as we wanted. And I just, I just kind of not resented, but to hear that everybody was pissed at life or had an agenda, I don't think that's a way to pull in people who did give their honest thoughts or feelings. I don't know, maybe, maybe it's, yeah, so I do go to nine o'clock church and I was encouraged and hopeful because there were a lot of little children today. So that was positive, hopeful. It was good to see, but for the middle yep. age and a little older, those, well, I'm, I'm gonna speak for not just myself, but others. They don't have an agenda per se, or pissed at life. It's just that, uh, some more transparency a couple of years ago. Um, things, I don't know, those are thoughts, but we were encouraged, urged, 
fill it out honestly. So I know a lot of the middle-aged millers did. So, so I, I'm so hopeful from this morning. I, I like seeing that, but I know if, um, so many people in my age group, they're, they're not here to share that with us now. So, and I didn't go into that with any kind of agenda. But anyway, yeah. I don't right. so you're, well, your your sharing and your candor um, only helps the process. However, if you heard me say <laughs> that there's a lot of people pissed and just or pissed at life, that that was a mis mistake on my part. Let me offer a corrective to that. There was a very tiny percentage of people who consistently in descriptive responses. Um, indicated that they were unhappy uh, either politically or that they had a particular agenda that they wanted to make sure that um, that our team understood. And so they were consistent in their responses. And I want to say that that was out of all of the 225, there was really, really only about 6% of respondents who said that. So that's a tiny percentage who we could see consistently across the board um, had a message they wanted to make sure got through. So if I, I don't want to, on the whole, people are actually really quite encouraged and, and um, you have every reason to be hopeful. Any other thoughts, questions? Yeah, I'm an older adult, and I'm concerned about your comment about the Church of the Fifties. Say how we I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing. Okay, I'm concerned about your comment about the Church of the Fifties and how it's gone. I think this church has a lot of older people that still love the Church of the Fifties. I think this church can have the Church of the 50s and the new generational church at one time. We don't need to separate those. So what you would invite in me if we got to have a conversation is what was it about the Church of the 50s that you so loved? <clears throat> and I bet that what you loved about that church is also what people today would love about the church. But the form of that system um, is increasingly unsustainable in, in Western culture. So that's really more the comment that I was making is that the form of it, the way in which we structure the committee structures, the building sizes, the, all of the, the format um, is without question, statistically speaking, um, increasingly not sustainable across the United States. So that was really more the essence of the 50s of the church that you fell in love with. I suspect a lot of us would affirm. Perhaps we'll have a longer conversation about that. Any other questions? Yeah, All right. Looks like we're okay here. Okay, great. So I put up on the screen that we're just at the very beginning of this. Um, and so I hope that you'll, um, you know, take a look at this and see that there's, uh, again, a lot more research that needs to be done. I need to report back to you on some additional findings. We'll have a series of educational webinars. So you'll have a better sense, actually, of what I've been talking about when I say across Western civilization, across uh, North America, the trends um, and then I want to take you on a tour of congregations who look a lot like yours does, but who are doing interesting things, prototyping in ways that I don't want to say are, you know, you should go do this, but they might spark some creativity with you. Um, and then we will also be doing some futures labs, which I'll talk about uh, at a later date. You don't need to know about those today. So uh, if you all want to find me, I hope you'll reach out directly. Here's my info. And otherwise, it's been an absolute delight to be with you. Thank you for listening. I can't imagine. Uh, I, I threw a ton of stuff at you. So you've been wonderful uh, people to sit through it. So have a great day. Thank you from all of us. <laughs>